It is terrible. And so what we're finding is social workers in both bachelor's and master's level programs are required to complete a practicum and often work in underfunded organizations that are just not able to pay them. This is resulting in many students taking on additional debt, compromising their economic stability, academic achievement, financial responsibilities, family responsibilities, mental and physical health. In fact, one study that P4P did and found was that students are skipping meals to save money in their unpaid placement to pay for their rent and utilities. Yeah, no, it's terrible. It shouldn't be the case. It is. And I just would like to share a few more of these statistics for, for your office just to be aware of. A survey conducted among students at UT Austin found that four out of five students in the social work department were experiencing financial distress. Additionally, another research found that many students working in their relevant fields were forced to quit their actual job in order to work their unpaid internship to be able to graduate. We need to find ways until we make this change in law uh, to find paid opportunities that can marry the practicum work with a, a paid job. Um, I think we should be looking towards uh, people who are working in the public sector, like myself, you know, whether it be a city council office, a school board, a county, somewhere in public policy, where the input of a social worker and their practicum can marry with the work that they're trying to do uh, in terms of public policy. I think that those are two very uh, uh, related fields. And I think a lot of public people in public policy need to have more input from social workers because social workers study systems and how these systems can actually help or adversely impact uh, families and communities. And so I think social workers have a lot to offer uh, those of us who are in public policy. So I think we need to find ways to, to get more opportunities until we change this law and they get paid uh, for them to work in public and, and, and with legislators or policymakers at whatever level. Absolutely. As an NSW student, I definitely agree with you, and I think a lot of the social work profession would also agree with you. And compensating social workers during their interns, such as the SWIFT bill, would address the devastating shortage of Texas social workers and encourage students who are hesitant about entering our field already to enter these programs and feel confident they'd be able to sustain themselves. As a social work student preparing to enter the field, I can say from my personal experience how compensating social work students would have enhanced my internship and educational experience, allowing me to focus on my opportunities and less on my financial burden of completing these unpaid internships. Without a bachelor's degree in social work, I personally have had to complete two internships in my master's. This is 960 hours of unpaid labor. This has left me working as an independent contractor, writing grants on the side when I could, working as a full-time student, a part-time graduate research assistant, and taking classes to maintain full-time status as a student while completing these internships. It almost seems like we're trying to make things harder to get people that we need. I mean, we should be doing the opposite. We should be looking for ways to make it easier. And in many other fields uh, in this state, we have found incentives for whether it be nursing, teaching, et cetera, where we have said, you know, you're going to get a, you know, either a debt loan payment relief or you'll get some sort of paid internship. We need to bring the same policies to increase the number of social workers in this state uh, by at least making it to where you don't have to work two and three jobs just to get your degrees. I definitely agree with you, Senator Menendez. And regarding your district, Senate District 26, I would just like to note that 24.9% of your district holds a bachelor's degree or higher in your population of 25 years or older, and 23% of your district is employed in educational services, healthcare, and social assistance. Bear County is home to 27 colleges and universities, 
and I really think that compensating social work students could impact your district specifically. Absolutely. We have, I think, in San Antonio and Bear County, a strong history of, you know, when I was growing up, we were known as a low-wage service sector town, a tourism town. Things have changed a little bit, but not quite there. Uh, we, we, we've been okay in terms of it's been it's, it's a low-cost uh, way of life. Of housing had been affordable, but just like everything, uh, I think we're victims of our own success. And with all of the people moving to Texas and the, the scarcity of, of housing, uh, we have a, an affordable housing, uh, a dearth of it, affordable housing. Uh, food prices have gone up, gas, everything's gone up, but wages have not gone up to the, uh, you know, comparatively. So San Antonio is a place that needs uh, a practicum, a paid practicum. San Antonio is a place that needs uh, more jobs in this sector. The other thing is too that when you have a history of, of poverty, and, and our city has a, a lot of poverty. Um, you have other issues that, that maybe we could use the benefits of social workers. You have you know, the obvious food insecurity. Uh, sometimes you can get alcohol and drug dependency. Domestic violence grows. And so you have a lot of issues. We probably have one of the highest percentages we have traditionally of teen pregnancy rates. And so there are, there's a, a, a tremendous need for social workers. And one of the biggest things that when I was working on David's Law, the cyberbullying bill that I passed initially uh, four or five years ago, uh, we noticed that in talking to high school students that they felt that the counselors, probably starting in middle school, especially through high school, never asked them about how they felt socially or emotionally. It was all about their academic grades. And therefore, they had no benefit whatsoever from, they didn't feel that there was a Place where they could meet someone or that someone could meet them where they were to meet their mental health needs. And so we've seen um, a tripling in Bear County of the suicide rates among teens um, probably in the last 10 years. And so there's, it's not a coincidence that all of these things are coming together at the same time. So it makes, it makes no sense to me why we can't get uh, policymakers we have record surplus budgets to invest in something that could help people where they need it the most, and that would be in the social Absolutely, and going into SWIFTS and looking at, you know, you're mentioning a lot of these costs, you know, within the community, but we also know that SWIFTS would have a cost, you know, to pass, and it does have a fiscal note attached to it. And although it didn't receive a committee hearing last session, and there is no fiscal note technically, our estimated cost is around 80 million for the biennium. And the number is based on data we received from the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board on the average number of social work graduates from the previous year. And we have identified somewhere in the budget bill, in Article 3, the Higher Education Board operating budget. But then one of their strategies in Goal D, the industry workforce, it addresses the mental health provider shortage. What do you think about this section, if that would be feasible in helping it pass? You know, you've said a lot. But, but let's, <laughs> let's, let's, let's simplify things. I, I think the best thing, and, and sometimes I think, for those of you in the audience, what you need to keep things, always keep your arguments and your, your questions and your ask as simple as possible. And the reality is this. Let's just, let's talk about the realities. Um, the state's budget is in the billions of dollars. Billions with a B. The uh, surplus was in the billions of dollars. Um, Jesus. We have sent to the border to militarize the, the, the Texas-Mexico border in the last eight years, probably 20, close to $20 billion. There's, we're wasting money on inhumane practices down on the border. So we're wasting all of these billions of dollars. 
And all you, you, you mentioned that the price tag was what, 80 million? Yes, for Spy Endium. So that's so, really 40 million per year. So that's basically a rounding error in the budget. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you think oh about God. it, if you really break it down, this is, it's, it's unconscionable. $40 million. We waste money in the state budget. They, uh, this last budget. So, in my opinion, uh, a budget, anybody's budget, your budget, my budget, yours, is a moral document. It's the document, it's, and very few of us actually have them at home, but what, but what I mean by this is we spend money on what we value. And so what means, what gets paid first off? The mortgage, the rent, because you have to have a, a roof over your head. Your car payment, because you need to be able to get to work or school. Food, medicine. The things that you know you have to have that matter the most. It, it bothers the hell out of me because it, where we at the state try to work together to bring up a budget that says this is what we value, this is what's important. If it were the case for me, we would be insuring families and kids. We wouldn't have the largest number of uninsured families and kids. Medicaid. We would fully fund mental health. We would meet. We would meet mental health needs where the kids are, not force them to find a way to get to an appointment. We would fund. We would fund the, the, the paid practicum. We would do all of these things. And so, last session when we had this this, this huge budget surplus, and we chose to once again waste money not do the right things. I, I was one of three senators who voted against the budget. Yeah. And um, you know, it, it, it's, not a, it's not a comfortable place to be. You're, you're sort of giving the middle finger to, to the people who worked on it. And, 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 but that's not the way I work. I wasn't trying to be offensive. I was just saying we could have done so much better. And we, didn't. we missed an opportunity with a historic budget surplus. And so my suggestion to all of you, if you do get a chance to visit, if anybody says to you, well, it's just so expensive, that's just so much money, how can you say that when you just had this historic budget surplus? How can you say that when you spent, and you can ask anybody, I'm sure your staff will tell you, how much has the state spent on the border? How can you say that $80 million over two years is too much money? When you can prove the shortage. You can prove all of these things, and this would allow people to help fill that shortage. This is an investment in your future. Wasting money is not an investment, and that's that's the thing. And the, the thing that gets to me is that some folks will try to you know cover themselves, use the blanket of conservatism, and you know saving money. People who don't have money are the most conservative financially because we don't have it to waste. You know, I mean, families that don't have money are the ones going to Ross, so the ones that are, you know, looking for the specials, or, you know. So don't talk to us about having to save money, you know, when you're spending it out, out this door over here. You're talking out of both sides of your mouth. And so I think, I know the money's there for this. I know the money's there. You should go to there. Don't get dissuaded. That's the other thing, that, the only other thing that I'm going to tell you. So many times social workers are so, by nature, you're uh, kind, you're thoughtful, you're, 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 you work well with others, you're thinking about, but sometimes you need to get a little bit kind of like, don't try to sell me a load of BS when I know the truth. <laughs> as we are about compensating social workers. <laughs> and I recognize that we do have some support in the ledge. We do have representatives Brian and Lalani who carried the companion bill in the house. We also have Zafferini who filed the SMART bill, the Student yeah. Mental Health Apprenticeship Retention and Training Internship place. Grant Program. So we do have some support, but I'm wondering if you could provide me with another way we should garner support and make this known. Well, I'll, 
I'll tell you, um, like I heard, we were in the back, and we could hear the presentation you were having with the slides about interim and session and this and that. And, um, you know, having been working in the building for so long, I've got to the point where I get a little sad at the beginning of session in January and February where all of these bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, eager faces come to Austin to say, hey, this is our idea, and we want this, and can you, can you help us with this and that? And the sad part is that I've realized that by the time we get to January, depending on what happened in November, see, in November, what happens in November? Elections. Elections. So depending on who gets elected, almost it's almost like the, the die has been cast the, the ingredients for the, the meal are getting selected in November. And depending on who gets elected, if it's going to be an overwhelmingly far-right, ultra-conservative, don't, don't talk to me about woke things, ESL or DEI or all these attacks that we're getting, we almost have no prayer. So if you want to know, what can we do? Now is the time. Yeah. Now is the time. Um, and here's the other thing. If you live in an area where, you know, because of gerrymandering of the districts, your only choice is in the primary, well then go talk to those candidates who are running. I don't care if it's a D primary or an R primary. Go talk to them find out about them, and, and get to know them. Right now, there seems to be a civil war in the Republican Party where between reasonable Republicans and crazy Republicans. <laughs> and, and, and unfortunately, the crazy ones are winning. And, and so you, you've got to get in there and say to the reasonable ones, hey, look, you know, we may not agree on 90% of things. But if you can meet me halfway, there's a shortage of social workers. Here's a way to do this. We need to pay them. You'll get an investment. Even if you say, you know, you need to stay in the state of Texas, if you get paid for a year, you get paid to stay here to work. You know, figure out some hook like they do with loan repayments. Maybe then you get someone who's stuck between having the far right coming after them and having people who would probably not vote in a Republican primary. And, and here's the thing, if you are this diehard Democrat like I am, but you're, this is your only choice on who you get, you need to get over it. You need to get over it and you need to say, these are my only choices for now. Now, if, if crazy gets elected, you need to be there in November and see if we can pull a, a, hair, a, hat, a rabbit out of the hat. Because that's what we're facing. Uh, right now, their, their number one thing is that they want to have uh, public school vouchers. They want to kill the public school system so they can replace it with a, you know, a religious-based voucher system. Um, yeah, well, of course, I know. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so this is a uh, this is this this is, this is this is a very frightening situation. I haven't seen anything like it in a long time. So. You all have to get involved, get engaged, learn. And you should learn who your school board member is, who your city council person, your county commissioner, because there's a lot of recruiting going on at all levels. Thank you for sure. sharing that insight. That really addresses a lot of what I want to talk about. I'm curious, because we are in a fiscally conservative state, how, how would you, and I know what you said about, you know, oh, well, we've wasted all this money, but how can you say that in, in a manner that actually reaches lots of, lots of people that we might approach with differing views? How would you approach those that we do have a lot with differing views? Once again, break it down to simplify what you're trying to say. Okay. A little more, a little more direct. So, if you're saying, well, well, we have this money and we should have 80 million, it shouldn't be all that much. 
how can we approach those with opposing views and tell them it's really not all that much in, in a polite enough way that we're understood, essentially. So you've got a good staff. I just saw him a few minutes ago. He was the guy speaking, Mr. Mattis, and ask them to give you a breakdown of the state budget. It's not hard. I mean, we can do it too. We can give you a breakdown of the state budget. There's lots of highlights on areas that, that we spend money. I would bet you, I mean, in the years that I've been in the legislature, I've been on the budget writing committee a long time ago. Um, we've had erratic, deep, deep, what's it, bull weevil eradication. Uh, you know, so, so okay, important, necessary. Uh, other eradication of something for a white-tailed deer population. You've got, there's, there are places that you can find in the budget, thank you, that you'll say, <laughs> what? You'll look at it and you'll go, we, we spent this much money for that, you know? And, you, and you'll be like, so if they come to you and they go, well, mm -hmm. you know, look at all that money, just find areas that are the same amount of money or more and go, wait, you had money for this. Yeah. Had money for that. And so just cut, you know, a few, you know, out of the billions of dollars of sending to the border, I mean, it would be it'd be so easy to get it done. This is not this is not a an issue of not having the money, it's an issue of not having the will. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I understand there are a lot of students in the audience, right? Yes. Okay. So, we have quite a few students from all over the state. <laughs> This is 24. We have a 21 year old and, and a 17 year old. And I, you know, my kids don't have a choice when it comes to voting and stuff. You know, they have to go. Um, but, but the point is this: a lot of them tell me that they they start getting angry, and they, I mean, I'm, they're like telling me they don't see the difference. You know, what's the difference between the Democrats and the Republicans? Nothing changes. They get they're, they're down on the whole system, and I can understand. Absolutely. But the reality is this, that just yesterday or two days ago, the governor was complaining. He's like, we're two votes away from getting vouchers, about, uh, two House members away. The people who want to do what they want to do are counting on every single seat, every single vote in the House of Representatives or the Senate. They're focusing, they're spending billions of dollars. And all I need from each of y'all is one for you to vote and then get your family members and friends to vote. That's all. I'm not asking you for money. I'm just saying, would you please go on election time? Just do a little research. And if you have a question, have these folks here, they'll tell you. That if you ask them, look, I live here, I don't know who I want to vote for, can you tell me about these candidates? I don't know much about them, I don't have a lot of time. I'm busy with my practice, I'm busy with this. They'll send you the information. It's not hard to just go. Early voting's two weeks. You know, you, it, it takes like five minutes. No one's there. <laughs> Typically, you can, you know, in San Antonio, you can do it at the mall. You can just do it while you're doing something else. It's not so. There are very few excuses. But here's the thing: the the people who are in charge currently are they are going out of their way. Because I had a bill that would require college campuses of certain sizes to have at least one or more election polling site on campus. And they fought me tooth and nail to not have that happen. Why? Because they're afraid of you. Because they know they don't want you to vote. They don't want to make it easy for you. So if, if we know these things, then why don't we all go out and do this? And, and I'll tell you that some of us that are more thoughtful about how we how we, we'd like to see the money go to helping the, the, those who need it the most um, we, we do get a little bit frustrated we get a little bit down we don't know how do we reach young people we don't know how we reach other people who may not traditionally vote so you can help us with that you know I mean I, I know that y'all and it's normal because I got elected okay so you should ask me for to, and you're gonna go to the, the, the capital and talk to staff and ask them to help but you also got to ask yourself, what, what's my part? What do I do? Absolutely. And I also wanted to address 
Now that we've moved over to some of our interview questions, I really would like to address one of the unique aspects and values of the social work profession is to challenge social injustices and advocate for marginalized groups and communities. It's actually fabricated into the NAA study of code of ethics. And so building off of what you've shared about how important this voting is, I would have some advice I'd ask for some advice for all of us here today. How can we actively engage with members in the interim to be most effective outside of voting? Um, over the years, I mean, I remember, this is really going to age, age me terribly, but <laughs> my first... Uh, election was in 1997 to city council. And um, I had a young man, about 18, come into the office angry, upset. I don't remember what myriad of issues, uptick in crime in his neighborhood, graffiti, this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. About 18, senior in high school. And I was so impressed with his passion, I was so impressed with his frustration with his commitment to his community. He had absolutely wanted nothing for himself. And I asked him if he wanted to join the team for work for us. And he did, and worked for us for several years, and I moved on, he moved on, and he's now, he's been working the last few years uh, in the city of San Antonio, and he's just now getting promoted to be assistant city manager in the city of San Antonio. Um, I, over the years, we've had had someone who started as an intern, she's now a professor at San Antonio College. Um, Pearl, who was over here, Pearl started as an intern in the Senate office when she was in college. She went to law school, she came back, she was ledge director, she's now chief of staff of the team. She's, she, she became chief at 29, young, probably one of the youngest chiefs of staff and one of the few, if not probably, maybe the only, I know the only openly gay Latina chief of staff. So, so, so the point is, if you have the capacity, the desire, the interest, uh, and we're blessed, I mean, I think part of why I'm here today, part of why I filed the bills is, you know, we, we have Alex Cow on our team, and Alex is an integral part of our team, who is a social worker. And, and, and she's working on her master's, and she's, you know, an uh, integral part of our legislation and what we do. And so all of you, and, and, and Alex started as an intern, and so all of you could start somewhere in some office somewhere by just going to meet the people who are serving in your community, and hopefully you will find people who are wanting to, to get someone who's bright and has good ideas and has work ethic and has a desire to make a difference. Because obviously you have the desire to make a difference or you wouldn't be here and you wouldn't be in this profession. So you want to make a difference through your individual work, but sometimes your individual work can influence the work of a policymaker who has, uh, who works whether on policy, whether it's at City Hall, at the county, at the school district, or at the state legislature, or at the, or at the federal government. So you all have the capacity to make that difference. So that's what I would do if I were in your position, is find opportunities to influence policy uh, using your education, using your desire, using your personal stories. Um, you know, for so many of you, I would imagine, I can't really see with this bright light, but just let's just see, let's do it for the case. How many of you raise your hand if you're first in your family to go to college? Raise your hands. From what I could tell, that was almost 80% of it. 80% of it. So I was also first, uh, both my parents are immigrants to this country, only spoke Spanish at home. And so it doesn't make sense that I'm sitting where I'm sitting. It, it doesn't logically make sense. It doesn't, there, there was no, no school for me to figure out how to get here. So it was just the desire to make a difference in my community, followed up by a lot of hard work, 
talking to a lot of people and then experience and then just doing, once you get in the door, do what you say you're gonna do. And that's, that's how you can make that difference. And so that's what I would do. I mean, obviously there's the, the stuff about the voting and volunteering and getting to know people and that's kind of an immediate thing, but I think it, your personal engagement with policymakers uh, can make a difference. Thank you. Before we close out on our portion on the SWIFTs and move over to the compact, if you have a few more minutes, I would be curious if you could share any examples of the impact social workers can have in the legislative process when we're actively in session. So we, in, in, in our office, we have continuously had meetings. And and Alex, in addition to her influence on, on health policy and other types of policy, she also does scheduling. And so, if the impact can come from things as, as easy as, you know, you mentioned at the beginning, I mean, every legislator, every policymaker has a hundred different places they could be, they're asked to be at the same time. And so you have to make decisions in terms of where you are going to. Uh, the most valuable thing any one of us have is our time. We will never get back the time that we invest doing whatever we do. We be invest or we waste, whatever we choose to do. And so for me to be here today, even though my wife had surgery yesterday, and granddaughter's at home, son's calling, all these things, it's because my team reviews every invitation. They go through them. They tell me who's saying what, what's the purpose, what are we doing, why, and then they make a recommendation. And, and I feel sorry sometimes for Alexandra because sometimes she gets asked over and over and over by people and I'm still studying whether or not if I make it, if I say yes to this, that means I can't do that. And, and some, some of the things get, get uh, conflicted. So, anytime you have an ability to interact with a policymaker or staff or anybody, you have an ability to make a, an impact. The other thing that you don't realize that you, you can do, every one of us know people who are hyper-political in our neighborhoods, whether it's your neighborhood president, whether it's your, you've got a relative who's a precinct chair, or you have... You know someone, a politiquera, you know, you know someone in the community who's really involved, right? We all do. Have you talked to them about these issues? Because see, y'all know more about the issues that matter, whether it's SWIFTS or it's a compact, than anybody else. So you could be educating people to help. So a lot of this is when we talk about passing laws, you have to build alliances. You have to build the group's gotta be more than just you guys. It should be principals, it should be teachers, it should be school nurses, it should be everyone in the ecosystem that would benefit from more social workers should be advocating for what you want. Everybody, but that, but that they won't know unless you're talking to them, you know? And so wherever you do work, you know, if they see you busting your rear end and juggling two or three jobs and trying to figure out how you make ends meet, you, they won't know unless you tell them. What's going on? Why are you so stressed out? Well, I've got this and I've got that and I've got this. Well, why do you have to do all this? Well, I've got to get this practicum and if I don't do this, but I still have to put food on the table and pay the bills. You gotta to talk to folks. You gotta tell them what's going on. And, and, and maybe that's the way we get enough people to go, you know what, that just doesn't make sense. That's kind of, that's weird. But that's the thing, if you don't talk, you, people won't hear you. And I think you guys are more in the camp of listening to people than you are trying to talk to people. And I think y'all are more the ones that are trying to solve everybody else's problems and not. But you gotta help recruit people to, to help you solve your problems. That's the only way it's gonna work. You know, and at the end of the day, uh, remember the last time whenever you were on a plane and they talked about the oxygen mask and the event if you're traveling with a child or someone who can't help themselves, put it on yourself first so that you can help the other people who can't help themselves. So 
So you are so busy trying to help everybody else, but you're not helping yourselves. legislators is what we need to be doing in our own communities, whether it's back at home or at the Capitol. But, but here's the, the mistake a lot of people make. They, a lot of folks think they've got to be talking directly to that legislator, that, that elected official. A lot of us have the attention span of an act. <laughs> we have ADD by nature, we're in a field for <laughs> getting pulled in a hundred different directions. And, and if we're good at what we do, the best thing any policymaker can do is hire the best staff possible. And mm. if you have staff that's smarter, better, better educated, uh, harder working, and anything like I do, then they will help keep that educator on point, that, that policymaker on point. It is, through, it is through their staff uh, that we actually get stuff done. We're the tool, we're the, 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 the voice, the person voting, we're the person that's the, the front, but that's just it. We're backed up by teams of people. So don't get offended, don't get disappointed, don't feel like you wasted your time. If you go knock on the door, and you're only gonna get a chance to speak to a staff member. Uh, that happens a lot, okay? But I will tell you, and I, I mean, and I, I get it up mostly from my older constituents. I didn't vote for you, I voted for him, and now I'm gonna to talk to him, and you know, they get upset. And, and, we're like, and I'll tell them, I go, look, you can wait however long it takes to get to me, because I'm gonna be doing a bunch of other things. But if you want your problems to start getting addressed immediately, talk to my team. And they will start working on it, because they'll start doing the research, and they'll figure out this and that and the other. And then they'll come to me and they go, we got a call this morning at eight, and this was the problem, and this is what's going on, and this is, and I, I made these calls, and uh, do we proceed this way or that way? What do we want to see? Them? And you see how much more work got done because they were willing to speak to the staff. And and I think that's a, that's a mistake that folks make. And, and do not assume that just because the staff is younger than you that they don't know what they're doing. Uh, that happens a lot. Okay. you today that I think we can implement, maybe even today at the Capitol, I know some folks have appointments that they're getting ready to go to, others may be walking in, is that okay if they walk yes. into your office? Absolutely. So here's the deal, um, you're going to know, you already know from the preparation you have, which offices have been friendly and helpful, make those the shortest visits, you know, hey, just want to stop in and say thanks. I just want to say, take a picture. Thanks for all the hard work. We appreciate you. Here's our contact info. If y'all need anything back home, you know, if you need someone to testify for something, here's here's our info. And keep going. You should be spending your time with the people who either are possibly. So, all right. A long time ago, uh, an older, wiser politician told me, 20% of your the constituency are are will always vote for you. They're the people you went to grade school with, they're your friends' relatives, they're people you work with, they're, they're, they're the folks you went to church with, whatever the case, those 20%, don't, you don't have to worry about, it. they're always gonna be there. 20% will never vote for you. They just don't like the way you look, they don't like your last name, they don't like it, that you did something someday, they, they blame you for, the, you took the girlfriend, whatever the issue is. <laughs> 20%, not gonna talk to you, never gonna vote for you no matter what. So is that what it leaves in the middle, right? It's that 60%. That's the way you kind of need to be looking at these issues that you're working on. Don't waste your time on, on the folks who are always gonna be with you because that's easy. That's like going to the gym and working on the stuff that you're the best at. And <laughs> then you don't work, and then you never work out on the other stuff that you, that you hate working out because it's the hardest. Work on those folks in the middle that, are, that, are, that you can educate and possibly bring over to your side. That's where you should be spending your time. And, and, and it's hard and it's not fun because sometimes you walk into offices and you're the only person that looks like you in that office. You cannot get, you can't get dissuaded. You cannot feel bad. You, that's the other reason why you have to find connections to people. So if you're gonna go speak to a legislative office, 
and you're from that hometown and you know you did some research went on their website and you saw a teacher that was a supporter of theirs or some uh, trade association fire police teachers whatever that's also supported them and you have some relationship figure out what relationships you have that you can say hey i also x and find a way to connect find some common ground and then and then you'll feel more comfortable they'll feel more comfortable and you'll you'll be able to to uh, help them in some ways the other thing is be friendly be accommodating and and be willing to say i mean this is the thing look legislature there's no it's no surprise or secret that it's been super majority conservative for the last 20 plus years so how does a democrat get anything to happen there you have to be willing to work with these folks you've got to be willing to sit down you, it doesn't do any good and i mean i mean even if if donna campbell herself were right here i told her the same thing I, we told each other in person i'd say i told my constituents your politics are crazy but you're a nice person and she's like, that's the same thing I say about you. <laughs> and, and, and that's okay. That's okay. We have to figure out ways. We have to keep talking. We can't become like Washington where they don't talk at all. And nothing happens. Nothing comes out of Washington because they don't even talk to each other. And so even if you're a diehard left of Bernie Sanders Democrat, you've got to, you've got to be willing to hold your breath Hold your nose and go into whatever <laughs> office to talk to me. If you want something to change. If not, keep doing what you're doing, you're going to get the same results.